South Wales boasts some of the most beautiful scenery in all of the United Kingdom. The Brecon Beacons National Park is a haven for those seeking an isolated solace. It is a place of beautiful fields, animals roaming the hillsides and looming mountains silhouetted against the sky. The weather can be unpredictable and the winters often bring snow and storms. The area is steeped in dark lore and to this day there is a belief that it is home to ancient spirits, summoned thousands of years ago by Celtic warriors. Rumours of witches' covens abound, and the veil between our world and the unseen world seems to be thinner here. Nature spirits protect the area, and are respected, and accepted, by some of the local people. In the middle of the Brecon Beacons, at the foot of a mountain sits a farm. Heol Fanog otherwise known as the Hellfire Farm. In the late 80s, Liz and Bill believed that they had found their little slice of heaven. They had both had turbulent pasts, but had found a kindred spirit in each other. Bill had been married and had a son Lawrence. His wife had had a painfully public affair and eventually left him and Lawrence. Liz had been battling severe anorexia for years and was working in a holistic medicine shop when she met Bill. They instantly clicked and fell madly in love, and wanted to find somewhere to live that was remote and isolated, and let them escape from their pasts. Heol Fanog was unusually cheap for the area, and the time, and it offered a studio space for Bill to further his career as an artist. It was perfect. Liz and Bill both spoke about a feeling as though they had entered a force field when they stepped across the threshold of Heol Fanog, as though it had its own energy and was welcoming them in, and they really took to country life with gusto. They got a pig, which they called Lucinda Ragworth Rigland, who became more like a family dog than a pig and would park herself indoors in front of the fire. They got some goats to keep the grass down in the garden but soon realised that goats are not actually full grazing animals, but they didn't have the heart to get rid of them. Liz was pregnant and set about readying the house for the eventual arrival of their son, Ben, and Bill spent his time making art to order in his new studio. He was proving to be a much sought after and successful artist, and there was no shortage of work. For the first time in a long time, both Bill and Liz felt as though they had truly left the past behind them, and they were truly thriving. In hindsight, the first odd event seemed so insignificant at the time, just a funny coincidence, that they probably wouldn't have even remembered if they had not made a joke of it. Bill was rummaging in the random drawer in the kitchen. You know the one that's full of old odds and ends. He was looking for an invoice that he needed to check over when he came across the receipt for the dinner that they had had the night before moving into the house. The total was £6.66. He barely noticed until he then picked up the receipt for their first grocery shop for the new cottage. £66.60. He chuckled. Hey Liz, come and see this. She looked and reminded him of the incident on the road on the way there. They had nearly been rammed off the road by a black Volvo with the registration plate 666. They both laughed it off and made jokes about being cursed and it being the mark of the beast. Neither were particularly religious, and they were so happy living in this idyllic life that nothing could make them feel ill at ease. The arrival of the new baby into the house heralded a new nighttime routine. Ben was a placid baby, despite having been sick when he was born, and Liz was naturally besotted by him. Late one night, Bill went downstairs to use the toilet. He had left Liz in their bedroom feeding the baby, and Lawrence was long in bed. He looked bleary-eyed into the mirror, washing his hands. When he felt the atmosphere in the house change, it was like the air had been sucked out of it. He found himself holding his breath. And then he heard it. 
Footsteps thundered above him and someone big and heavy seemed to sprint down the landing and stop outside the room where he had left Liz. He hopped back upstairs ready to scold Lawrence when he saw nothing. He poked his head into Lawrence's room and he was breathing deep and calm like someone fast asleep. A sinking feeling began to grow in his stomach and he burst into the bedroom to see Liz quietly motioning at him to keep the noise down as the baby was asleep. What happened? He asked her in a tense whisper. Why were you running? She looked at him confused. She hadn't heard a thing. There are lots of things that can account for nighttime sounds, especially when there's a new baby in the mix. So Liz and Bill simply didn't discuss the incident again until much later. In fact, as their life rolled on, he probably forgot about it. But something had changed in the house. There seemed to be an impenetrable darkness that infected the rooms and no amount of light seemed to lift it. Liz threw open the curtains, lit candles and incense to try and dispel the shadows, but something had definitely changed. Bill stood in the kitchen one afternoon, rifling through their post when he opened a letter and went deathly pale. It was an electricity bill for £750. In the late 80s, a £750 electricity bill would be more fitting for a factory than a small farmhouse. So obviously Bill contested it. There was no way he would or even could pay a bill this huge. It was ridiculous. It's important to note at this point that the electricity bill is, and continues to be, one of the most compelling parts of this story for a variety of reasons that will come to later. The house was investigated countless times and by countless professionals. Bill and his solicitor worked out that even if every appliance and light in the household was on permanently, there would be no way of the bill costing that much. Each appliance and power source in the house was checked independently and none were faulty. Each appliance and power source was also checked by Swalek, the electricity board for Wales, but none were faulty. There was no logical or scientific explanation to be found for the amount of electricity that was somehow being used on the farm. Bill and Liz and an independent electrician reported turning all of the electrical supply to the house off and still watching the numbers on the meter whiz around as though huge amounts of energy were being used. And it wasn't the only electrical anomaly to occur. Liz reported seeing bizarre lights that would shoot around the barn, almost like a laser show. Blue and white orbs would zoom around the farmhouse. And they began to suspect that the electrical surges that were plaguing the farm were something more than just faulty electrics. As the house became dark and dour, and they battled the electrical companies. Their luck seemed to evaporate. Almost overnight, Bill went from being a sought after and respected artist to a veritable failure. Every single commission he had fell through and no one was interested in buying his paintings. Their car failed inexplicably and so did the next car and the next car. But life had to continue as normal for the sake of the children. The atmosphere in the house seemed to intensify as though it was building up to something. Liz was feeding the baby in her bedroom when she heard a deafening crash. The door to the nursery at the far end of the corridor had slammed shut, so hard that dust had fallen from the ceiling. There was a brief pause, and then the next door, Lawrence's room, slammed shut with ferocious force. And then finally, the door to her room slammed shut with such a crash that jewellery had fallen from her dresser and Ben began to wail in fright. She looked at the jewellery on the floor and then at the door in shock and had a dawning realisation. The door hadn't slammed shut because it was already shut. In fact, the door hadn't moved at all. The sheer, bizarre unreality of it hit her like a ton of bricks, and she feared that she was losing her mind. That night, away from the ears of their children, Bill and Liz sat at the kitchen table and discussed the earlier events. 
They both heard the footsteps at the same time. Bill had been joking about them having a ghost when slow, shuffling steps began above them. Liz stared at Bill as his smile froze and then faltered on his face. They listened in horror as the footsteps shuffled down the corridor and then stopped at the top of the stairs. And then the unmistakable sound of a footstep on the top step. A pause. A shuffle onto the second step. A pause. The dawning horror consumed them both. It was coming down the stairs. Third step. Pause. Fourth step. Pause. They sat frozen in horror, staring out the kitchen door and into the hallway. Fifth step. Pause. Sixth step. The tension was palpable. They knew that whatever was in the house was just out of sight, at the bottom of the stairs around the corner. Bill eventually plucked up the courage to investigate. And found nothing, of course. Whatever it was, it wasn't ready to show itself yet. It was shortly after this that they began to notice the smells. Bill had been working in the studio and went to the kitchen to have a break when he was met with the unmistakable stench of sulphur. Naturally, he thought there was a problem with the sewage system, so he called in a local tradesman. But by the time he arrived, the smell had gone and there was no sign of any issues. The smell would appear and disappear throughout the house, and so too would the sweet smell of perfume that didn't belong to anyone in the house. The temperature would range from boiling hot to below freezing instantaneously in various parts of the house, and again checks showed no problems with the heating or the plumbing in the house. The heat was sometimes so intense in certain parts of the house that it would make them sweat profusely and have to leave the house to cool down. All in all, the situation seemed to be getting more and more bizarre and Bill decided it was time to start asking some questions. The neighbours were decent people, and when Bill met them one day while out for a walk, he couldn't help but spill about the strange goings-on in the house. His neighbour looked at him, an older man, and simply shrugged and said, There's no luck to be had there. He went on to tell Bill a story about the land. Many years before, a manor house had stood on the land, Bill knew this to be true, as the ruins were still visible. What Bill didn't know was that as the manor house had crumbled away over time, local farmers had taken stone for building and renovating their own houses. This isn't out of the ordinary in rural communities. But what was unusual were the gravestones. Manor houses traditionally had their own grave sites, and generations of the family would be buried on their own land. It was widely believed that gravestones were excavated, broken down, and used in the building of the farmhouse at Hale Fanog. It would be an easy leap to assume that the house was being haunted by the ghosts of the disturbed grave occupants. But unfortunately for Bill and Liz, it just wasn't that simple. Life in a haunted house takes on a certain type of routine. They got used to the car troubles. They were locked in a seemingly eternal battle with the electrical company as the bills kept rolling in. The smells of sulphur and sweet perfume came and went and they became accustomed to spots in the house feeling like a raging inferno and conversely other spots being below freezing. But the worst thing for Liz was the eternal feeling of being watched. That was the real nightmare for her. She would be in the kitchen and would feel the tingling prickling sensation that someone was watching her every move. The hairs on her arms would stand on end and she found the anticipation unbearable. She felt as though whatever was in their home was just waiting to strike at any second. But she was also crippled by the fear that what was happening to them wasn't paranormal at all. That her and Bill were suffering from some sort of shared psychosis. And she didn't know which frightened her more. One day Liz had taken Ben out for a walk. 
It was a blustery, fresh day. And it was when she was returning and walking back towards the house that she saw it. She stopped in her tracks and stared up at the nursery window. And staring right back at her was a face. Her heart thudded in her chest as an old woman looked at her from the window. She could see every wrinkle on her face and this woman was watching her from inside the house. Soon after she saw the old woman, they began to have trouble with the plumbing in the house. The tiles in the bathroom would rise up as though something was attempting to burst out from underneath the floor. They obviously called out a plumber to have a look. And like all of the other issues in the house, there was no explanation. But the plumber told them that he wasn't surprised. The previous occupant, Mrs Holborn, had had all kinds of trouble here since her mother had died. Unexplained plumbing issues and every time the plumber visited with his apprentice, the apprentice always came away feeling as though they had been watched the entire time. The other thing that bothered him was that he knew the builder that had worked on the renovation of the property. And this builder had told the plumber that he had been really spooked when he found the remnants of big black gravestones built into the walls. It wasn't long after this, one day Liz entered the nursery to check on Ben during one of his daily naps, and there, sat in a chair next to Ben's cot, was an old woman, watching him sleep. It was the same old woman that Liz had seen watching her from the nursery. Liz slumped against the door in shock, and in the blink of an eye the woman was gone. Now while the apparition of the woman was disturbing, Liz wasn't frightened of her as such. She was shocked by her sudden appearance, of course, but she instinctively knew that this woman was not responsible for the pounding footsteps, the sulfuric smell, or the temperature changes. And most importantly, she knew that this woman was not responsible for the sense of dread that was growing in the house. Something was also happening in the land around Heolfenog. Every single animal that Liz and Bill owned systematically died, one by one. But so did the animals of local farmers. Lambs were being born with serious deformities at an alarming rate. So much so that the local vet was baffled as to how and why this was happening. Bill's work continued to decline and the family were now living in serious debt. They breathed a sigh of relief when a neighbouring family commissioned Bill to do a painting of their prized horse. Bill readily agreed and set to work on it. He wandered the wilderness until he eventually found the perfect background for the painting. Beautiful, picturesque and serene. He was really proud of his work, but was unable to get one of the back legs right in the painting. No matter what he did, or how many times he painted, erased and repainted, it always seemed to look slightly deformed or injured. Annoyed and frustrated, but still pleased with the overall outcome, he accepted defeat and presented the picture to the family who were delighted with it. They paid Bill and hung the picture in their house. But not long afterwards, Bill received a phone call. It was his neighbour. The horse had died. Bill commiserated with her. And there was a long pause on the other end of the phone. Yes, the horse had died. But it had died from a mysterious ailment that had left its back leg deformed and injured. When they found it, its leg was misshapen and twisted, and because of the sheer size of the animal, they had no choice but to bury it where it fell. There was another pause. The horse had died in the exact spot that Bill had chosen for the backdrop of the painting. He had chosen the backdrop at random, but the horse died in the exact position it had stood in that painting. The neighbours burnt it. It was around this time that both Liz and Bill began to see something else in the house. 
They would regularly see a seven-foot, shadowy figure that would move around the perimeter of their property, often slipping in and out between the trees. Both regularly saw the shadowy figure out of their peripheral vision move through the house. They knew that whatever this was, it was not connected to the old woman, and that whatever it was felt well and truly evil. You're probably wondering at this point why in the world they didn't seek any help. The truth is that this story is littered with priests and mediums and spiritualists, plumbers, builders, electricians, dowsers and everyone in between. While Liz and Bill believed that everyone who arrived at the house had good intentions, they found that more often than not they weren't very helpful in the end. They were told numerous times that they had something demonic in the house. Numerous exorcisms were performed at various points and by different people. One group of people claimed that Bill was cursed, a fear which actually deeply impacted him as it led him to believe that the suffering being inflicted on his family was his fault. One pair of spiritualists went through the possessions of the family and removed and burnt everything that they believed could be some sort of conduit for evil. This included books and many of Bill's paintings. Each time someone arrived, they would tell a story so convincing that the family would be filled with hope that this time, whatever was destroying their lives would be gone. And each time there would be quiet for a few days until they would feel that familiar prickling sensation on the back of their necks. After one of these sessions in particular, the house had become quiet and Liz believed that everything was back to normal. At this time, Liz and Bill were sleeping in separate beds because he found he worked best late at night and didn't want to disturb her by coming into bed late. It didn't really make much difference to her because they'd gotten a new cat and it was driving her mad and keeping her awake every night. It would crawl under the bed and growl at nothing until she would eventually fall asleep and forget about it. One night she woke to the cat under the bed again. But this time it wasn't just growling, it was snorting and snarling under the bed. And that was it. She was sick of this and threw her pillow under the bed to frighten the cat. But it didn't stop. She groaned and swung her legs out of bed to turn the light on and go and fish the cat out from under the bed. But she found nothing because the cat wasn't in the room and the grunting sound continued. She stood in the middle of the room feeling her heart start to hammer when she realised that the sound wasn't actually in the room at all. It was outside the window. Her second story window. She took a step towards it and the sound stopped briefly as though whatever it was was watching her move towards it. Eventually, she threw open the curtains to nothing, only blackness. Every time they got that sensation, that hot prickling on the back of their neck, they knew that this thing was close by. As I said, they had glimpsed it many times, a huge shadowy figure that moved in their peripheral vision. Bill was in the kitchen when he got that familiar hot, prickly sensation and the hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. He knew that he shouldn't look, because no good had come of that before. He stared straight ahead and willed himself not to turn around, feeling the air turn heavy around him. He was struggling to breathe, and he gripped the counter until his knuckles turned white. He knew he had to run. He could feel it. He turned around and that was the first time he properly saw it. The thing that had been making their lives a misery. The embodiment of evil. This time it wasn't a fleeting glance. This seven foot thing was in the kitchen. It was the shadowy figure of a man standing as still as a statue. It had the hooked beak of a bird and though it didn't move, Bill knew that this thing was alive. He ran from the kitchen, and not knowing what else to do, he prayed. And a man named Eddie Burke 
was to be the answer to their prayers. Eddie Burke wasn't a religious man, but he had worked on some high-profile haunting cases and believed he had a gift to help relieve issues in houses. He agreed to help Liz and Bill out and was accompanied to the house by none other than Maurice Gross, who famously investigated the Enfield haunting case. Eddie explored the house and then told the couple everything they needed to know. In their house was an old woman who was benevolent there was also the ghost of a murder victim and the murderer and this turned out to be historically accurate a farmhand had been bludgeoned to death with an axe but there was something else there which other people had mistaken for demonic it was something ancient a creature that had been summoned thousands of years before in an ancient celtic ritual that was used to strike terror into enemies. This ancient being was not of Christian origin, so exorcisms were never going to work on it. Eddie set about ridding the house of the presences that were trapped there. And whatever he did, it worked. The electricity meter stopped spinning wildly, and within a couple of weeks their electricity usage was completely normal. The footsteps and the apparition stopped. And to this day, there is no explanation as to what electrical anomaly was taking place on the farm. They only saw the bird-headed creature once more, standing atop a hill watching the farmhouse. But there's one more thing that makes this story really strange. When Liz saw the lights in the barn, it wasn't actually the first time she'd seen those lights. Just before they moved to Hayol Fanog, Liz, Bill and Lawrence had gone to Egypt on holidays to fulfil a dream of visiting the pyramids. They visited the pyramid of Sheops and got up at the crack of dawn to be able to beat the rush to explore the heart of the tunnels. Liz was the first to reach the centre and was taking it all in in the dark chamber when she saw blue and white lights almost like lasers dancing around the walls. No matter what she did, she couldn't figure out the source of the lights. When Lawrence and Bill eventually caught up to her, they didn't see the lights, but Lawrence turned to her, looking pale and frightened, and whispered, Can you feel that? They were apparently simultaneously gripped with a sense of absolute terror, and all scrambled down the corridor to try and get out. Although when they did get out, none of them could explain why they were so frightened or what happened to them. During the haunting of Hayal Fanog, Liz and Bill fled to her mother's house for a couple of weeks to get a break. And during this time, they experienced mysterious pools of water and footsteps throughout the house. Except they also found something else in the house. One day, Liz's mother arrived home to find a pendant in the middle of the floor. She had never seen it before and picked it up assuming it was Liz's. It wasn't. And no one could ever figure out whose it was or where it came from. Except that it was very clearly incredibly old. And was covered in Egyptian symbols. When the entity finally made itself known to the couple, both Eddie and Bill described it as looking like Horus the Egyptian bird god. Admittedly, a lot has gone on in this story, but there are some undeniable facts. The electrical company couldn't figure out the electrical anomalies, and many tradespeople reported strange things happening while they worked in the house. A dog warden who Bill and Liz called to the house as their dog was behaving strangely almost didn't go because she was so frightened to go to that house. She had been friends with the previous occupant, and had experienced the pounding footsteps in the house when she house sat for her friend. Odd animal deaths and animal behaviours were reported on the land. Three dowsers arrived on the land to tell Bill and Liz that their property was on an anomalous crisscross of ley lines, which had created a black stream of negative energy. You can believe what you want about this story, but I feel like something happened there. The last thing you'll probably notice is that at the beginning of this story, I referred to Bill's son, Lawrence, from his first marriage. 
and I probably never really mentioned him again. He actually has a much bigger part of the story than I made it seem. Bill and Liz, according to the book Testimony, believed that Lawrence was possessed and eventually sent him to live in a boarding house in the nearest town on the advice of an exorcist. He was angry, aggressive, painted his room red and obsessed over horror films watching them late into the night. But he remained on track in school and teachers saw no change in his behaviour. It's important to note that the book doesn't really make this connection but Lawrence's change in behaviour comes after a period of great turmoil in his life. His mum and dad had split up after his mum had had an affair with another man and his dad quickly moved on to a relationship with a younger woman who subsequently fell pregnant. And while Bill and Liz might have been shocked by Lawrence's behaviour and believed that something had possessed him, his behaviour wasn't beyond the realms of what is normal teenage rebellion, combined with a reaction to trauma. For that reason, I chose not to explore that part of the story in this episode. But what about the other children? In the end, Liz and Bill had three children in that house, Ben, Rebecca and eventually Thomas. In an interview with Rebecca, she reported that at the time she didn't notice anything strange about the house. Until during a conversation with her siblings and her mother years later, she asked, Mum, who was the old woman who used to watch us in the nursery? 